Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. All right, folks, welcome back to the Human Performance Outliers podcast. This will be episode 270 and the final episode of 2021. So I'm uh, looking forward to releasing this final show and jumpstarting 2022 with a couple of really fun interviews as well. Going into the new year, I'm definitely going to continue kind of a mix between kind of solo episodes as well as the guest interview ones uh, with a target of probably around four guest interviews per month and a couple of solo ones heading into the new year. So feel free to send over any guest suggestions or topics that you might want me to address on some of those solo episodes coming up in 2022, just for a little bit of uh Foresight is uh, a guest named David Mariani, and David is uh, fairly popular on Instagram at basketball.biology if you want to get a little bit of a primer, primer for that episode, but he works very closely with Ben Patrick, or for some of you will remember as the knees over toes guys, and he is very much embedded in their philosophy of strengthening from the ground up and working on movements that you're going to find yourself in in sports, even though they may not necessarily be the most ideal positions for your body to be in. So essentially, the thing we talked about in that episode the most was how do you put yourself in a position to be able to tolerate those impacts and those stressors that are going to come from sport and activities that oftentimes put our bodies in positions that are maybe less than ideal. Also coming up later that month and probably mid-January is what the release date's looking like it's going to be, is an episode I did with Dave Feldman and Dr. Nick uh, Norwitz. And for that particular episode, I actually reached out to Nick because I wanted to have him come on the show to kind of just discuss his uh, nutrition program or his nutrition protocol. He is uh, very low carb, I believe, if I remember correctly, somewhere in the neighborhood of like 30 grams of carbs per day. So very much would fit the definition of strict keto. And he kind of does it in more of a Mediterranean diet framework. So I'm kind of curious as to kind of how he goes about picking his foods and things like that. But as, uh, as I was discussing with him to come on and chat about that, he asked if we could uh, do an episode first where we also bring in Dave and they kind of highlight the paper that they just recently released on a lean mass hyper responders. So we did that first and I'll look, likely look to have Nick come back on the show down the road to just kind of share his background, his history and what led him to a low carbohydrate diet and why he structures it the way he does. But that's some, some future stuff coming up in 2022. For this episode, I have Dr. Kevin Stone coming on the show. He is an orthopedic surgeon at the Stone Clinic and the chairman of the Stone Research Foundation. He trained at Harvard University in both internal medicine and orthopedic surgery and at Stanford University in general surgery. He's a world-renowned expert in biologic joint replacement Dr. Stone has served the U.S. Ski Team, the U.S. Pro Ski Tour, the Marin Ballet, the Smoyan Ballet, the Modern Pentathlon at the U.S. Olympic Festival, and the U.S. Olympic Training Center. He's innovated work in the orthopedic arena, has led to multiple awards, publications, and grants, and has resulted in approximately 50 issued U.S. patents. Dr. Stone just released a book recently called Play Forever, How to Recover from Injury and Thrive. In this episode, we looked at a lot of things uh, in the realm of how do we put ourselves in a position to age gracefully enough that we can continue doing the activities we love without necessarily sacrificing, you know, having fun and pushing our limits when, you know, when we're younger. So. Uh, we kind of danced on that topic for a bit with, with Dr. Stone and got his two cents or maybe a little more than that since it was over an hour long uh, on the topic. So uh, looking forward to uh, sharing that interview with all of you. Uh, but before we get started and welcome Dr. Stone onto the show, I do want to thank all the listeners who do support the show. There are multiple ways to do that. 
You can do it monetarily through the show's Patreon page, which does get you ad-free episode, audio, and early release. And those come in at different tiers of $1 and $3, depending on whether you want them early released or not. So the way that's set up is when I finish recording an episode, I'll usually try to get it up on Patreon as quickly as I can. And those $3 per month uh, subscribers will get that audio free audio right away. The $1 subscribers still get that audio ad free audio, but it's just going to get released on the same day as the, the episode that includes ads. So if you want to support the show and get access to that stuff, head over to the Patreon page. Links in that can be found in the show notes as well as at my website, zachbitter.com forward slash HPO. Uh, you can also at zachbitter.com forward slash HPO uh, contribute with a one-time donation, bypass all third-party third party apps if you want. There's a, uh, an option for that over there. But if not financially and you want to help share the show's message and things that I'm talking about on here, uh, it goes a long ways if you like, subscribe, uh, share the episodes with your friends and family members as well. So if that's a, a way you want to help out, I would love to love for you to do it. Um, specific sponsors for this show is uh, my friends at Bioptimizers, and uh, they want you to know about Breakthrough Magnesium. Breakthrough Magnesium is the only organic full spectrum magnesium supplement that includes seven unique forms of magnesium. There are actually seven unique forms of magnesium and you must get them if you want to experience its calming sleep enhancing effects. I'll usually take two of these before bed at night. And one reason why I don't mind recommending Magnesium Breakthrough is because Bioptimizers always offers their 360 day money back guarantee. So you can try it out risk-free. And if you like it, great. If not, you can send it back. You can also get a 10% discount by using the promo code HUMAN10. So head over to bioptimizers.com forward slash human, plug in HUMAN10, that's HUMAN10 into the promo code slot for 10% off your next order. You can also find these links in the show note as well as the HPO sponsors page on my website, which is zachbitter.com forward slash HPO sponsors, where I have the list of all the show sponsors, the links, discounts, and details. All right, folks, thank you for tuning into this episode and help me welcome in Dr. Stone. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast. And I'm joined here today by, by Dr. Stone. Dr. Stone, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, it was interesting when I, when I kind of heard about your story and your background, I was just looking at kind of the lists of things that you've been involved with and just, I guess, kind of the topics that we'll talk about on this show. And I was like, yeah, I've got to get them on. <laughs> Um, do you want to just share with the listeners a little bit kind of about your background, kind of where your interests kind of began and what led to you getting involved with like sports and then ultimately, uh, taking a look at just like people being active well into their, their older ages and things like that. Sure. So like so many of your listeners, uh, you know, I was a college soccer player and rower injured my knee playing soccer. I remember the move stretching out my leg against the Brown attacker when I shouldn't have and uh from brown university and uh it's that mental error that i remember that led to my tearing my knee joint meniscus and like i admired the orthopedic surgeon who took it out though i didn't admire what he did which was taking out the key meniscus cartilage in your knee and so many of your listeners have had that same experience i'm sure and unfortunately that of course leads to arthritis later on that we'll talk about some more but for me it inspired me to uh enter orthopedics and one day, years later, I was out for a run with my mentor, a guy named Dick Stedman at the time, and he said, you know, if you could figure out how to replace the knee joint meniscus, you'd make a big contribution to orthopedics. And so that started out my career in the late 80s and have been working in cartilage regeneration and replacement and working with athletes of all ages ever since. So I'm here in San Francisco at the Stone Clinic. We also have a public nonprofit research foundation called stoneresearch.org. And you, so everything we do, we uh, back up with the kind of science that I think is necessary to help push the field forward. Awesome. I think uh, with running, I know best, obviously, because it's a sport I participate in. I work with a lot of runners and there's kind of this like little bit of an understanding, I think, once you get into the sport that it's not really a question of whether you're going to get injured at some time if you do it long enough. It's like, when are you going to get injured and then what are you going to do to kind of get back? And I think as 
as runners, a lot of times we'll be kicking ourselves when we finally do get injured because we'll look at what we were doing or like, oh yeah, I shouldn't have done that. I should have been doing this. And then you, you kind of start seeing a little bit of a clearer picture and, and hopefully over time add to kind of like just a, a, a repertoire of things that are going to best keep you healthy outside of the actual training that you normally would do and things like that. And I know you've got a lot of experience with a variety of different athletes. I think was the U S ski team, uh, ballet, um, modern pentathlon, just generally with the Olympic training center and things like that. So I'm sure you've seen a variety of different training models as well as what they're doing to stay healthy and things like that. But is there like a type of injury that you see more or less pop up more frequently that, uh, that we could be avoiding or, or are there things we could be doing to avoid that injury? Sure. So just coming back to the runners for a sec, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, your joints are designed to run forever. There's running does not injure knees. The cartilage inside your joint can last forever. A good example is an elephant, you know, it can run 60 miles an hour at 15,000 pounds. Their cartilage rarely ever becomes arthritic. It's only the injury that leads to arthritis. So if you run with good mechanics and we can talk about that and you do all the other things that you've been so, you know, a proponent of in terms of health and fitness and weight and attitude and mental approach that we can talk about as well, you can keep your joints going forever. The key is once you get injured to fix that injury, to repair, regrow or replace the damaged meniscus or cartilage in the knee or ligaments and really Think not the way we used to in the past where a surgeon would jam cortisone in your joint and tell you to go back to it or tell you, hey, you're done with running, you know, rest your knee and wait for your knee replacement. The whole approach is completely different now. We're in what we call an anabolic era of orthopedics. And by anabolic means we have the tools to stimulate healing. We have the tools to stimulate your body's own stem cells to divide and come to the site of injury. We have the tools to replace the meniscus cartilage and regrow the articular cartilage. So we're in this wonderful era now where our goal is to keep you playing forever, which is the name of the book that I just released this week called Play Forever. Um, And much of the information in that book is about how I keep you and keep keep you going forever. And if you get injured, how we repair those injuries. Awesome. So are you, for some of the more modern stuff, is it kind of in the lines of a lot of like the injectables, like platelet rich plasma type things? Is that what you're referring to or? Sure. Platelet rich plasma or PRP, as many of your athletes have heard, is is sort of the baseline of where we are now going in terms of stimulating cells and stimulating tissues to induce whatever repair we can. But what we've learned is it's not just the direct stimulation from the growth factors in the PRP, it's the recruitment factors in that, those injections that recruit your body's own cells to the site of injury. And that's where all of our research here at Stone Research Foundation and Stone Clinic is all about. What we wanna do is figure out how do we target which injection, which factor each athlete should get. So clearly a injured ACL needs a different set of stimulation than an arthritic knee. Uh, And we're learning which joint should get which type of injection. Interesting. Is there, so once the injury happens, uh, if it is like arthritis in there, is the injectable going to help kind of clear that up? Or is there like follow-up types of strengthening type things or mobility things that you need to kind of do to also speed up that process or restabilize that area so that it doesn't kind of continue to be a problem after the fact? So let's talk about both sides of that question. So okay. what the injection does is it stimulates more lubrication inside the joint. It, by adding growth factors to lubrication injections, we can make the lining of the joint produce more lubrication, which makes the joints feel better. But on the mechanic side of it, clearly we've all learned that bad biomechanics will destroy good biology any day of the week. So that gets to fitness, diet, gait, running style, surfaces, all the things that are so important. And we can talk about each of those. Yeah, it gets really interesting because I think like there's, or the way I kind of sometimes understand this is like, there's like the the mechanics of like a specific activity or the way that like is ideal. 
And then there are situations that kind of put you in a situation where you're not always maybe able to abide by like the rules of proper mechanic. When I think of like, kind of like pro basketball players or, you know, someone, or maybe something a little more in your category with like skiers where you may find yourself kind of in a position that is less than ideal. And is there like, is there for, for those specific sport athletes uh, with, within the running severe, probably like trail runners, we get a lot more varied terrain and like one foot plant might be quite a bit different than the next, just from the, the trail surface. Is there like anything with the training pro protocol stuff that is, that is good to kind of strengthen areas like outside of that normal, that normal mechanics so that you are able to better tolerate some of those awkward positions you might find yourself in? Sure. So let's look at what our definition of fitness is. And so, so many of our runners come to us having just run forever (laughs) and have kind of forgotten the fact that, uh, you know, the old three sport athlete was a lot better prepared than the single sport athlete for dealing with injuries and avoiding injuries. And so with our runners, especially our elite runners, and, and listen, I have people who are in their 60s and 70s who still want to run centuries. And they'll come in with an arthritic knee and say, hey, doc, isn't there just a shock absorber? You can put my knee and help me buy time. And indeed, we do that. We put a meniscus back inside those joints often. Or if they're totally worn out, we'll go ahead and do a type of joint replacement that permits them to run on it. But fundamentally, we need to look at their overall fitness. And remember, fitness is about balance and coordination and accuracy and mobility. And we've learned so much that about mobility and how important it is to come before strengthening. And so many of our runners, when we look at them, are very tight around their IT bands, they're tight in their low back. They, you know, they haven't done the kind of cross training that we would love them to do. And part of our mission is to teach them how and, uh, and show them how to stay healthy and recover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one of the things that is always interesting to me is when I was younger, I played a ton of different sports. So it was, I didn't think of it at the time. Cause I mean, you're a kid, you're young, you're just like, you just kind of assume my body does what it's supposed to do when I want it to do it. And if you do a little too much one day, you might be a little sore the next day, but it wasn't really that big of a deterrent. Whereas you know, now that I'm 35 and had focused on kind of long endurance races for the, the fast decade plus, you get a little more kind of compartmentalized and I'll notice that I'll go out and like, you know, hit some golf balls around or something like that. Whereas when I was younger, you do something like that and the next day it's like, you know, not really a big deal. Now it's like, oh, wow, I forgot that. Like there was that weird movement that I'm not doing as much anymore. Now I'm a little more sore than maybe I would have been in the past. And it's just like a little reminder to me that there's a lot of value in being more multi-sport or kind of where I like to do it is in the early stages of kind of like a, of a phase of a season where I'm kind of still in off season mode and kind of entering maybe some specific training, working on some of those kind of like weaknesses and things that are maybe a little less specific to the actual like goal target I'm going to end up peaking for, but I know that are going to kind of build a strong enough foundation so that I'm able to tolerate some of the stuff that maybe would come up and injure me just because I'm so kind of one dimensional when it comes time to peaking. Is that like kind of the, the side of things you see some of the more professional athletes you work with angle towards, or is that something that is more just like good advice for the average person? Both. I mean, we don't have any professional athlete who doesn't focus on nutrition and fitness and training and massage therapy and using a great physical therapist for mobility. But one of the things, you know, you can think about for your runners is that you don't have to give up running to running days in order to cross train. If we look at other athletes, so none of our skiers, ski racers at at a top level, none of our ballet dancers at a top level would go out and perform without having spent an hour beforehand in their stretching and mobility program, in their warm ups. And almost none of our runners do that. They throw on their running shoes and run out head out the door. And our better runners do it. They really actually take the time both before and after running to focus on mobility and focus on cross training a bit. And it makes a huge difference to them. And that's one, if you can pass that on, especially to your endurance athletes, that the sport is the sport that you love, but preparing for it both before and after makes an enormous difference in your longevity. 
Interesting. And do you have that? And I, I, I can appreciate there's going to be individual components too when you look at someone's like, you know, strengths, weaknesses, where their imbalances may be and things like that. But are there some kind of go to pre workout, like mobility or strength routines that you would suggest that runners more or less incorporate or start from as they're kind of putting together a program that would support their running endeavors? So one of the things we've learned over the time over time is that people will do what they like to do. <laughs> and so one of the important things we do early on is you find out what kinds of warm-ups, what kind of other things does the athlete like to do? And then work with those things to be creative about how they can help the their deal with their specific weaknesses or tight joints or tight aspects of their body. If you try to impose stuff that people don't like to do, they'll do it a little bit and give it up. <laughs> so you know, if you like to also spin, then get a spin bike and put it right before, you know, right in your garage before you go out for a run. You know, if you like to use a Pilates reformer, put one where you can use it. If you like to do squats as your cross training workout, you know, set up a little squat rack or a squat routine that you can do beforehand and then go for your run. It's, it's so much more important to figure out what you like to do than to force other stuff on that you don't. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I can definitely relate. I know in the past when, you know, I'll get maybe even a little too structured and I'm thinking, okay, I need to do this, 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 and then you know, inevitably there'll be a bunch of stuff in there that looks good on paper, but in practice, I'm going to get bored with it or get distracted. Or as soon as I get busy, it'll be the first thing that kind of goes out the window versus like you said, finding something that you really want to do so that even on those days that are a little more stressful, you're, you're motivated to incorporate it. Um, and I think uh, the one thing I like to share with folks too, especially when it comes to doing like speed work type stuff with running is kind of closing that gap between rest and the intensity at which you want to perform at. And it sounds kind of like when you describe the different things that you can incorporate in, whether it's like cycling before your run, where you're, you're kind of getting the body warmed up in a lower impact way. So then when you go out, things are a little more smooth when you start to kind of bear some of those impact forces that running is going to uh, provide and I kind of think of it along the same lines as when I'll have one of the coaching clients of mine or myself warm up before a speed workout where I'm going to do some light walking, jogging, some dynamic movements, uh, maybe some accelerations and things, all these things that are kind of closing that gap between rest and the intensity at which they're going to do their workout at is, is that kind of the, the direction you like to see with that sort of stuff? Yeah, I think you nailed it. The other thing is that if people have access to water, the pool is the most underutilized, best cross-training tool, both for pool running, pool stretching, uh, deep water exercises. The body just feels awesome in the pool and everything stretches out well and the injuries are low. You don't have to be a swimmer. If you, even if you're, you know, walk 20 laps across the chest deep water in the pool and do that every day a little bit faster, it's a phenomenal exercise tool and mobilizes all of the joints. Interesting. Yeah. The, I, re, I remember in college, we would, as soon as someone would get hurt, it would be straight to the pool for aqua jacking. <laughs> They'd even give us uh, these little like kind of floaty belts that helped a little bit. Cause it's like, we we're as, as runners, we were oftentimes would just sink straight to the bottom of the pool with very little skill sets in there. But uh, I, I remember that being a pretty good workout when you really get moving in there with the aqua jog stuff. So um yeah, there's a lot of opportunities, I think, to cross train that can be fun. And once you kind of dip your toe into it, they can sometimes get as exciting as the sport you originally got into. And, and, uh, and then you kind of have a little bit more tools to kind of play around with when you're looking to get active. For sure. Do you find that uh, when you're working with folks, uh, I know you've talked a little bit about just uh, with kids kind of getting into sports is uh, like, what do you see the difference between kids who were kind of more multi-sport versus ones that are more one dimensional where they maybe found themselves being a little more gifted at an early age at one sport. And then they got kind of driven into that more exclusively versus kind of doing what I remember as a kid where in some, I, I mean, I lived in a four seasons environment. So we'd have a lot of kind of interesting things where in the dead of winter, we might be indoors playing basketball, but spring and fall and summer, maybe outside playing baseball or soccer or something like that, that was a little more outdoorsy based and uh, kind of getting that full experience. And do you see a lot of issues popping up when people come in with the little more of, a, I guess we call a modern approach to specialization? 
Yeah, we really did. And over the last 10 years, we've been singing that story, that song to uh, all of our patients and their parents of kids and, uh, and coaches as well. And I, I think that message has gotten out pretty well. The problem, of course, is recruiting. And uh, recruiters are looking for that single sport athlete who's in summer camps and winter programs and, and year round training for their sport. But there's no question that the athletes, especially kids, do better with a whole three sport mentality, multi sport mentality. And for folks who are past their schooling ages, one of the things we like to tell people is pick a new sport every six months, pick up something new every six months. It doesn't have to replace your main sport. But it has to add variety to the things that your repertoire of things that you can do. Number one, it keeps your mind in the game. Number two, it it adds other stresses in, in a good way to the rest of the body. And it keeps you having a healthy approach and attitude in life. And then if you get injured, that knocks you out of one sport. You haven't lost all your others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I know uh, with injuries, what are, cause inevitably these will happen, or maybe someone's listening here and they're like, this is all great, but I already got myself injured. Uh, what are things that you focus on in terms of kind of learning from that? Are there kind of clues that certain injuries will, will put you into as like, well, this got injured, therefore you're likely doing this wrong, or this is what you could be doing differently. Are there for some of the big ones, like maybe knees, ankles, and hips and that sort of stuff. Are there specific types of things when someone comes in with that type of an injury that you're able to say, well, this is what we probably need to focus on to make sure that this doesn't happen again when we're thinking about rehab and eventually returning to the sport? Sure. So the number one cause of injuries that we see is a mental error, meaning your mind wasn't in the game. You were thinking about somebody else. You were thinking about your cell phone. You're thinking about who knows what. And it's just that momentary lapse of focus that usually leads to the unfortunate error that you knew you could have avoided and you just weren't there. So the first part of it is mental training and, and thinking through how to focus, how to be truly within your sport and how to not be distracted when you're there. And then the second part of it is getting a really good assessment. So it, it takes having an athletic trainer or a physical therapist work with you and look at what you're doing, how you're moving, where your flexibility is, and they can often help you predict what things are going to go wrong and help you design a program to, to avoid those things. And we almost never see an athlete of any level who doesn't have weaknesses somewhere. So if we repair somebody's ACL or replace their meniscus, we then design a program for life for them so that they not only get through the first year of, of rehab and hopefully coming back fitter, faster and stronger than they were before they got hurt, but then we outline what we call stone fit tests over time where they come back and get tested and nobody should be able to pass it because there's no athlete at any level who is truly strong all the way around or to, truly flexible everywhere or, or who hasn't forgotten about one other part of their fitness program. And our goal is to help them focus on those so they can truly play forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I find that when I'm in the gym and getting curious, it's kind of like whack-a-mole a bit where it's like, okay, I've, I've kind of gotten this area a little bit up to speed, so to speak. But then like, there's another area. Okay. Now, now I have to address this or make sure this part is too. And uh, I think like, you know, as, as adults, it gets a little more formulaic because we get a little more structured. Whereas kids like kind of go out and play and maybe put ourselves in, in position to like do those movements and stay a little more, a little more resilient amongst a wide range of, of, of different activities. So I think you nailed it there too. So, you know, even in our top level endurance athletes, if you ask them a question, what'd you do to play today? And it's an important, it's really important that they see what they're doing as fun and play. And even if their main sport, they've gotten to a level where it's not as much fun, it's more work for them then how to add in other things that are truly play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it, it kind of feeds into what we were talking about before too, where you're kind of making it exciting too. It doesn't feel like you're, you're doing work to get to your sport or your activity. You're doing something that's fun on top of it, which makes a ton of sense to me. Uh, do you find like when, when there is, maybe let's just focus on knees because that's probably, I would imagine something with the skiing background that you're very familiar with. Is there any type of strength work? Uh, I guess maybe this is a little more of a holistic question too. Is like, what role do you see in terms of like strength work around the trouble areas 
in a way to like strengthen the muscle and possibly the tendons and ligaments in that area so that they can tolerate a bigger load when they're being asked of that. Are there particular types of movements that you see a lot of the skiers doing in the gym that are like, these are just ones that they really need to strengthen to make sure they're more or less trying to bulletproof themselves in a way where when they get out on the ski hills or the moguls, they're a little more resilient. Yes. And if you look across all sports, if you were to pick one exercise that would be kind of the best overall exercise that crossed sports and and helped diminish injuries, there's no question that's the squat. Mm. That if people do a squat with good form, it's a safe exercise and it really does work all the parts of the body that need that kind of strength and power and fitness to be able to play most sports. Uh, then if you look in the gym for skiing athletes and winter sport athletes, it's taking the squat and then making it a dynamic exercise, whether those are side to side slides, uh, balance boards, jumps through ladders, you know, all the different things that we do with athletes. It's fundamentally taking the squat and making it a dynamic exercise. So if you were to focus on one thing crossing across many sports, it would be both the static squat and then really a dynamic squat. Is there like movements that you recommend for folks as they're, if they're really new and they're, you're maybe not ready from a technique standpoint to just start doing squats that are going to feed into that type of movement that they can do with a little less, uh, maybe margin for error in the early days. Sure. Well, first, most important part of course is mobility. Cause if you have poor mobility in your hips and your low back and in your knees, then your squat technique's not going to be very good. Now that said, we still can adjust that positioning for people who are older and very stiff. And I have 70 and 80 year olds still doing squats and doing it well, even though they don't have full mobility. So I think that's the first thing, having someone look at you, look at mobility, look at your technique and start there. But you can simply use stretch cords and you can use uh, all kinds of resistance things across a, a pull-up bar and just doing balance exercises on a trampoline and on a unstable bozo ball and just doing knee bends and single leg knee bends, double leg knee bends, really easy things to do that help get you in that positioning to be able to do a good quality squat. Now, let me also remind you that, that for your older athletes, because remember, I've got a lot of older athletes between 40 and 80 who are doing endurance events, who are pushing their sports, who want to get better every year, who want to win their age groups, or who just want to be able to perform. So designing exercises for them is as important as for all our young athletes. And what we've now learned is that the old advice of, hey, you know, wait for your knee replacement or have a knee replacement and go home and rest your knee or other joints it's exactly the opposite of what we tell patients now. We want people to increase their exercises on their joint replacement, not decrease them. And the reason is that only resistance exercise builds bone. There's no other way to do it. So either weightlifting or hill hiking, you know, you've got to have resistance exercise. Additionally, the more you exercise, the stronger your muscles get. And so stronger muscles and stronger bone uh, cause those joint replacements to last longer, not shorter. And so, you know, we're working with athletes at all ages on the spectrum and finding the ways to keep them playing and keep them exercising is a hugely important part of what we do. Is that partly because like, if you're like have a weak muscle or I guess weak bone area that that's just going to put more pressure or more load onto those joints when, when you are doing those movements? Yeah, exactly right. So in normal walking, you take two to three million steps per year at up to five times your body weight. And so, as we said earlier, you know, bad biomechanics can destroy good biology any day of the week. So if you're walking with a bad gait, if you're walking with a stiff hip or a stiff knee, you're not absorbing through the full range of motion of the knee joints. You're overloading one part of that joint and causing it to wear out sooner. So gait mechanics really matter. Mm -hmm. And I think the most common scenario that I see with runner injuries is there'll be something that's bothering them a little bit that isn't enough to really sideline them, but it is enough to alter their gait just a little bit. And then they end up compensating with a different area of their body. And then that overcompensation just increases the training load that they had historically adapted to, but not that directly to that one area. And then that one area that they're, uh, they're using to kind of 
support the slightly injured spot is what ends up becoming the big problem down the road. That's really right. So pay attention to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to all those little signals your body, body's Listen sending up. you and, <laughs> and, and go from there. Um, yeah, it's, I, I want to like transition a little bit into just kind of just some sports specific stuff that you are into knowing that you are an avid skier yourself. You've worked with the Olympic ski teams and things like that. And uh, sometimes our listeners, I think, and myself are really interested in just what kind of is happening behind the scenes with these athletes in their preparation. I know like if someone sees me on race day, they'll see me doing a specific type of running and they probably, it's easy to extrapolate and think, well, Zach just does a ton of that all the time. But if you'd actually shadow me for a day, week training block, you'd start to get an idea of like actually what all goes into it and how many kind of varied training approaches are included within uh, the very event specific stuff. Uh, is there, could you share with us like kind of just a more or less a basic uh, outlook of like, what is a skier doing kind of like in the off season to get ready for, for the season? What are they kind of doing in those early phases of training? And then ultimately like in their, their peaking phase, uh, is there kind of like programs that more people are in line with, or is it just such a wide variety of things that it can be pretty specific to the individual? There's a fair amount of consistency in what uh, skiing athletes certainly are doing, but there's a difference in intensity. And so, and I think you'll see that in the gym too, and any sport you're doing. So most people are, are focusing on the plyometric dynamic strengthening exercises that we've all learned to do and seen in the gym. It's just, when you look at the top level athletes, they're, um, their ability to do more of them, their ability to keep their mind focused, their ability to use more hours of the day training um, really matters. And so it's not that they're doing a different exercise than you and I are doing, but they're doing it at a different intensity, a different focus, and a different uh, volume. One of the other things you'll notice is that the better athletes will maybe listen to music, but they'll never watch TV or read a book while they're working out in the gym and training. And we've learned that that takes about 50% of the benefit away. The ability to listen to your muscles and listen to your heart rate and listen to your breathing and know when you've gotten up against your edge of fitness and then push a little bit farther really determines whether or not that workout session propels you to the next workout session better than you were before. The distracted athletes simply don't get that benefit. So when you watch a world-class athlete in the gym, and whether it's the summertime or in between events in the winter, their focus differentiates them initially from every other athlete in that gym. And then it's intensity and volume. So I think there's a wide range of things that, that athletes of all ages and sports can take advantage of. We, there's not a lot of uniqueness in what we're doing, but there's a lot of difference in intensity and focus. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's a, a fun point to discuss, I think, is the focus part, because it gets difficult, I would imagine, in skiing. I know in the sport of ultra marathon running, for me, the hard part is you know, I might be doing a 100-mile race where it's kind of hard to relate to the varying points of a 100-mile race without doing it. So you find yourself in this situation where even if you're racing relatively frequently, there's, there's probably only a few opportunities per year where you're actually out there, you know, discovering what it's or reminding yourself what it's like to be 70 miles into a hundred mile race, 80 miles into a hundred mile race. So I find like some of the stuff that I've learned the most about over the last few years that I think have fed into, you know, progress uh, for myself has been just like, how do I visualize and focus and practice those mental aspects uh, of those points in the race that I can't really experience until I'm actually there. So, uh, like some, some examples of that are just like, I'll be out there doing a specific workout and I'll be like pretending I'm in a specific part of the phase of that race and visualizing what it's like to be there. So then when I do get to that point in the race itself, uh, I feel like I've been there more recently in mind, even though that my body maybe hasn't been quite, quite there since the last time I did it, I would imagine with skiing, you get kind of a little bit of that play where, you know, there's only so much of the actual like hundred percent all out competition level exposure you can give yourself without too much risk with not enough reward. And is that kind of one of the values you see with that group 
by doing that sort of focus visualization. So they're kind of training their brain to do that activity as much as they are their body. So you, you describe it really well. And the skill sets around visualization and practice are certainly great skill sets. But what we learn a lot from our athletes is that their body and their mind already know what to do. And it's the question is, can they keep focus there? And one of the tools we've learned that really great athletes use is imagination and fantasy. So that when you're there and that 80 miles into a hundred mile or, you know, your, your ability to just fantasize about, you know, that victory or that best time or that finish or that something glorious that you just imagine yourself doing kind of carries you along and permits you to perform at a level that's outside of almost all of your training or your limitations and things that you thought. So the things that we're, we find when working with athletes and whether it's, you know, just coming into surgery and getting out of a huge injury and recovering, or whether it's in the middle of running a century, it's um, can they take themselves beyond where they thought they were? Can they use the tools of creativity, imagination, and fantasy to elevate their performance? And really great athletes do that really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting, kind of an interesting thing to think about when you just start piecing together the whole package of the physical aspect of training, the mental aspect of training and competing and all that stuff and how it all kind of plays out. And I know when, for me personally, when I do it right, it kind of almost highlights when I've done it wrong in the past. So it's, it's, it's a little bittersweet where you're like, Oh, that's what I need to be doing more of in, in training. And then you look back and you realize like where you maybe missed out on in the past, but to a degree, you always have to go back to, I think making it just like a long-term journey and you're always learning from your mistakes. And if you're actually reflecting on how things went versus other times you find yourself, you know, finding new levels for yourself and new ways to kind of uh, adapt and, and progress in the sport you're doing. Indeed. <laughs> um, one other thing I wanted to chat with you about too, is just kind of, well, I guess we could, when I think about just kind of fixing the big movers or taking care of the big movers in, in training, uh, are like kind of square one. And then you can add in some of these, like m what I would consider like more, I don't want to say fringe, but like little, maybe smaller movers that are best addressed once you've kind of got the big foundational things in place. And when I think of like the big foundational things, I think of like the proper training and uh, just so consistency at the right training load. So then that kind of brings in the, the work rest piece of the puzzle and uh, hitting that right. And then sleep being kind of partly bleeding into the rest recovery side of things, but, you know, getting the right amount of sleep is a huge mover that I think a lot of people can improve on if they optimize that. And then the, the third one is always kind of like nutrition and I think when people can get those three things right, they check off a lot of boxes and then they can start kind of whittling away at some of the other things that maybe look a little bit cooler sometimes on paper. Uh, along the, just the nutrition side of things, do you find like there are specific foods or types of things, or I guess it could even be micronutrients. It wouldn't have to be a specific food group or food, uh, but that is going to be more beneficial for injury prevention when we're talking about like ligaments, bones, and muscles and things like that. You know, the data is all over the board on this stuff. And so what we generally counsel our athletes to do, given that they have a wide variety of nutrition preferences, is that if they can focus on protein and water, they'll do a good job of getting the bases covered. And diminishing the carbohydrate loading and any other, you know, sweet drinks. So it used to be that you would, in an endurance race, as you well know, really only have the goos, the carbohydrate boosts along the way. And those really are not appropriate for the ultra marathons that we're seeing our athletes do and you're doing because you're not only using up your carbohydrate stores, you're really burning muscle. You're using up your protein. And so one of the things that we're working with people on is to see, can we get protein supplementation that would be delivered to the body in a better way during endurance, at, endurance events than what has ever been available in the past. But outside of the endurance athlete, 
many people's diets would benefit from focusing on lean protein and water, uh, especially for those who are overweight, where if they want to optimize their weight, which matters hugely, as we mentioned, the number of steps per year you take, if you can optimize your weight, you really diminish the load on those joints. So I think that's the core of our nutrition counseling. Everything else after that becomes a lot of preference and a lot of taste, a lot of what people like to have. Um, and there's not really good data that any of the supplements make a huge difference. We think glucosamine probably has the best data in terms of diminishing joint stiffness and increasing joint lubrication because it's a key precursor of hyaluronic acid. But all of the other micronutrients, all the other vitamin supplements, all the other things that we look at with our athletes, um, it's hard to wrap solid scientific data around them. Interesting. I think like, yeah, protein is one. We, I've gone down this rabbit hole a few times on this podcast, and I've been fortunate to have some of the you know, top protein researchers uh, in the country and world actually come on the show and kind of share their stuff. It's been really fun to hear guys like Professor Don Lehman, Stu Phillips, Professor Jose Antonio, uh, kind of share like where we're at with that. And one thing that kind of rang true or kind of the message that came when I was speaking with any of them was just kind of like protein RDAs are probably one of the more like in need of having a revamp in terms of what we should actually be targeting. And then, you know, then on top of it, getting the right types in the sense that, you know, obviously protein is one gram of protein isn't necessarily created equal depending on where it's coming from. And obviously you can combine different sources to, to increase it if you're going kind of a plant-based route, but all you can also get the full complete thing through, through meat or lean cuts of meat and things like that. And, uh, is, is protein something that you see athletes making one of their biggest mistakes nutritionally around, or is that something where, it just really depends on the person and the type of athlete. I would say across the board, the deficiency, if I were to identify one that's most common is in protein supplementations, protein sourcing and protein volume. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting too. Cause I think in the running, you get different sports. It's like, it's really actually fascinating in my opinion. One of the reasons why I like to sometimes talk to like the bodybuilders and the power lifters is because they seem to almost have gone the other direction at certain points in, in, in that sports evolution, where it's like, you know, the, getting almost freakishly high amounts of protein relative to what they probably need versus endurance runners who I think sometimes look at it as like, Oh, if I, or maybe not so much anymore, but historically, I remember when I first started getting into running, there was definitely a little bit of messaging. If you looked for it, that was like, you know, protein, you should limit or, you know, not have too much of, cause it potentially would make you bulky or something like that, which obviously, I mean, running is a power weight ratio sport, but uh, I don't think focusing on minimizing your protein is probably the proper path to go forward in terms of finding the ideal power weight ratio. And in fact, it may actually negatively impact it in the sense that extra protein is more or less probably going to keep around some lean body mass. And if anything, help you shed a little bit of the non-lean mass and improve that power weight ratio. Uh, have you seen that messaging kind of improve over the last years or has it been a relative non-issue within the skiing community? I think the messaging just gets confused because the various diets that keep coming up. And, uh, and I think people learn pretty quickly that if they can listen to their body, they learn what works for them pretty well. And so our well-adjusted fit, high-performing athletes have kind of figured it out. It's the athletes who are doing poorly, especially the injured athletes, who find that their diet doesn't support them well, and that there's a disconnect between what they think they need and what their body's screaming that they need. And especially in the post-injury time, you really are screaming, your body's really screaming for that protein supplementation. And I think if we could do a better job at delivering it in more palatable forms, in delivery vehicles, the way carbohydrates have been delivered over the years, then I think we'll do better. Interesting. Does, uh, for the skiing groups, is there a pretty wide range of when we step away from protein? I think protein is the one where most will agree that is like, you want to get the right amount of that and, and you certainly don't want to like eliminate it. Uh, but 
is there a pretty wide range of folks that are focusing on more lower carbohydrate diet versus higher carbohydrate diets? Is it kind of a spread amongst that, or is there a direction that most are going in the skiing community? Yeah, it's hard to know because, because people don't publish much about sure. uh, what they're actually doing. <clears throat> I think the buzz in the skiing community has still always been first on carbohydrates because uh, uh, a lot of the pasta sponsors have been big sponsors of skiing events. But I think most of the athletes that I work with are focusing on how do they deliver enough protein, given the amount of weight training that they need to do to perform at that level. Interesting. Um, cool. I think, uh, I think this has been kind of a fun, fun chat about just a, a variety of different topics around fitness and things like that. Uh, is there anything that you would share in terms of what someone should maybe focus on as they're, as they're aging through sport? Because, uh, one thing I think that is always interesting is when you look at just, when we get into the very elderly population, you start seeing situations where, you know, they may be quote unquote healthy in certain ways, but their bodies have gotten weak where they're one fall away or like just looking at life differently where like, if this person, like if I trip and fall, I probably get up and I'm perfectly fine at worst. I'm maybe bruised or have to like take it easy for a couple of days. Whereas, uh, you know, someone in their eighties or nineties, they fall and, you know, they break something and now they're not mobile. And that could be kind of like the start of the end for them, so to speak. So is there, are there different things like that is more beneficial for that elderly population to focus on in a different way than when they were younger, even if they were active at younger ages? Taking the attitude of treat yourself like a pro athlete, you deserve it. So, we're, you know, identify someone to help you with your nutrition, your fitness, your physical therapy, your weight training, find sports and play partners, diversify your exercises, even if you're 90. And believe me, I have 90 year old athletes who are just phenomenal athletes. And what they've done is they've figured out how to play and how to recruit the resources around them to help them you know, play forever, as we like to say, and, and hopefully drop dead at 100 playing the sport they love. So the first message is treat yourself like a pro athlete. The second message is that resistance exercise builds bone and bone is what breaks when you get older. And so you need to constantly be doing resistance exercise. The third message is fix the things that are broken. We've gotten really good at replacing ligaments, replacing meniscus, regrowing cartilage, don't live with an injury that then leads to arthritis. And as I like to say, cancer may kill you, but arthritis ruins your life. And so if we can help do the things that avoid arthritis and treat it and cure it, then our athletes of all ages will do better. Awesome. I know uh, in your book, and I do want to chat to you a little bit about, about that before I let you go, but you do talk about uh, just like a fitness test that, that is recommended to kind of assess where you're at and where you steer a little bit of the direction of where you're going to end up going. Can you tell us a little bit about the fitness test and, and why that might be a, like a good thing to kind of include? So as you're moving through, through life, you stay on top of these sort of things. Yeah. Test yourself regularly. So we do what's called a stone fit test here in the clinic. We've got several great athletic trainers, fitness coach, physical therapy team. So all of our patients go through that kind of fitness assessment before and after surgery and before and hopefully to avoid injury. But give yourself that kind of assessment. Let someone look at you. Let someone look at you in the gym. Let someone look at you when you're training. And then let someone look at you when you're playing the sport you like to play. You'd be shocked at what an ob a well-trained observer sees when they watch you exercise. So don't let yourself believe that you've got it nailed because all of us can improve. Be uh, Let your ego down and let someone else look at you and say, you know, if you just might try this, it might help you. And, and that's what any pro athlete would do and what they do every day. And um, treat yourself like a pro athlete. That would be the message. Perfect. And uh, a little bit about your book in general, it's called a uh, play forever. You want to share with the listeners kind of where you're heading with that and then where they can ultimately find it. Sure. Play forever on Amazon. Um, and really what we've done in that book is try to help all of the athletes that we get a chance to work with play forever and uh, avoid injury and how to recover from injury if they are, and then how to thrive. And so 
Uh, a lot of that book goes to the lessons we've learned over 30 years and the world-class athletes we've had a chance to work with, lessons we've learned from them, and lessons we've learned about replacing tissues biologically and bionically. Very cool. Uh, where else can listeners find you if they're interested in kind of seeing what you're up to and, and learning more from what, what you have to share? So we post everything at stoneclinic.com. We post our research at stoneresearch.org. And uh, both those sites have lots of educational videos and uh, teaching videos and other information to help people stay active. Very cool, Dr. Stone. Thanks for taking some time to, to come on the HPO podcast and, and chat with me. I'll be sure to put those links in the show notes and uh, hopefully people will be interested in checking out your, your book and figuring out how they can, they can play forever. Here we go, Zach. Good to talk with you. <laughs> Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. All right, folks, if you are interested in adding some structure to your training program, I have some options that might interest you. Over on my website, ZachBitter.com, I have a wide range of ready-made plans that have options for beginners to advanced endurance athletes. I also have personalized plan options where I will cater a plan specific to the event you are preparing for and your personal schedule and training availability. You can also access a variety of add-on options from email collaboration to consultation calls to help guide you through your training and nutrition needs. You can access these with or without a formal plan. So head over to ZachBitter.com and let me know what you think.